Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're about to get started here in a minute. Just wanted to make sure uh, everybody can see my screen, uh, hear my voice, uh, so that we can get started here in a few. Please, somebody uh, let me know uh, via the comments that you can uh, hear me. All right, we're good. Got some good answers here. Thank you. We'll get started in a minute. Um, just going to wait for a couple more people to, to sign in, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get moving. Thanks again for joining us. All righty, let's get started. We got 58 minutes to go. We got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get going. I'm sure more people will be joining as we go. But thank you all for joining us again today in our four part series on CPM scheduling for construction professionals. Uh, my name is Michael Pink. Uh, I am the founder of Smart PM Technologies. Uh, we are a schedule analytics company and software. Um, that leverages my 20 years of experience as a construction schedule and delay analyst. Used to work at um, uh, Deloitte, KPMG, FTI. I used to get involved in projects of all types and sizes all over the globe, studying mostly schedule data. I mean, that's what I did a lot for my delay analysis, but we also did, you know, um, rescue and recovery projects. We did project control support. We built schedules, we reviewed updates, we did a lot of different things for a lot of different reasons. We analyzed risk on scheduled data. So I've spent quite a bit of time looking at this information and I've seen quite a few things out there. Uh, this course is designed to teach you as much as we can about a good schedule management process, soup to nuts, starting with building baselines, understanding what scheduling is all about, getting into scheduling updating process, and then starting to get into understanding uh, oversight and analytics, uh, which start to push us into more of the project controls realm. Um, I have a background uh, in, in industrial engineering, uh, also planning and scheduling professional and certified cost engineer, so I know a thing or two. Um, today, this is our third series. Thank you all for everybody who's, who's attended the first or the second course. Um, we talked about the basics of CPM scheduling, which is very entry level. We got into how to build a high quality baseline schedule. Getting into schedule quality is an important thing, understanding that there is a science behind this methodology and that if you don't know that science, there's a lot of risks to managing a job if you build a schedule that's not very good. 
now we're going to get into updating. You know, once you build a schedule, you're not just going to look at it and say, great, you're going to actually start using it. And one of the best things that you can do is update it periodically, uh, which help you better understand the job. Um, at that point in time, helps you status the information, know what's coming up next, uh, translate that information to the people in the field, but it does come also with a responsibility in following best practices, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So without further ado, here we go. First thing we're gonna talk about is why is this important? Um, what is the reason for the updating process? I know a lot of people here already know these things, but some people do not. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about a good quality updating process, schedule updating process that is of high quality to get the results you want to get um, through best practices. And we'll talk about some of those. And then we'll get into reviewing these updates because the schedule updating process isn't just, um, you know, putting a bunch of information into the update and submitting it. You, you need to review it. You need to have a process for reviewing it and somebody else is going to review it. So you need to make sure that you're following these best practices that the decisions being made through this schedule update are feasible, realistic, that the schedule is not falling apart as we go. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how do you review that. Uh, we'll get into some do's and don'ts. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about what we're going over next week. So let's go. First and foremost, why? Why do we update schedules? What's the point? You know, I've worked with a lot of different companies out there and, and doing a lot of different things. And I've seen in some cases, they build a baseline and they just don't update it because for whatever reason, I don't believe it's worth their time. Um, but it is an important process. Usually it's in the contract that you do need to be updating this information. And it's not just because owners want to be a pain. Uh, it's because it's an important function. First and foremost, yes, we need to know where the project stands uh, from the data's perspective. Uh, you know, this schedule data is important. The schedule data is useful. You know, you can't just walk on a site and look at it and say, hey, yeah, I guess we're on track. You know, what you need to do is make sure that all the things that are getting that need to get done over time are getting done at time, over time. And if they're not, we need to understand that they're not. Uh, we need to understand the status of the job at different points in time. Uh, the other reason it's important is when you build a baseline schedule, it's it's a it's really a an educated guess of sorts. You know, people who build these schedules have a lot of good experience, assuming that they've gone through the process of laying out a plan that made sense and was feasible and 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 uh, achievable. Um, we also know that you know some things don't happen as planned. We all know that uh, things don't happen like maybe equipment doesn't get delivered on time or maybe we're waiting on permits or maybe change orders are happening. Uh, but because of that, it's important to look at every update as an opportunity to readjust and understand based on what we know now. Because a month after you start the project, you learned more. And a month after that, you learned even more. So we wanna incorporate those things into the schedule because if you're taking a schedule that started out with a plan that was somewhat based on experience and not really living the job, then you're really, um, you know, at a good point in time to adjust and, and plan going forward with this new important information. And that's sometimes a problem because a lot of times people don't make changes to durations. Uh, sometimes they don't incorporate realities into the schedule, but we want to talk a little bit about that today. Most importantly to me is the fact that critical paths change. You know, having studied delay a lot, you know, a lot of times people look at the critical path of the job from the beginning and they get that in their head. And that's the way those are the most important things for the job. But the reality is when some things happen in accordance with plan and other things do not. If you status the job with that information and you adjust based on the learnings that, that are happening now that you know about now, you may find that the critical path changes and the near critical path may change too which if you recall what we talked about over the last couple of weeks that critical path methodology really circles around understanding prioritization via the total float metric and the most critical of all paths is the longest path and the one with zero float and that could change and if it does change if your critical path last month is no longer the critical path today you want to know that uh, because you want to know where resources need to be to manage to the end date 
And that's what the critical path will tell you. What, what path today extends from now until the end date that, such that if it's delayed, it will have an impact on the end date. And that can change, it's dynamic. It is not a static thing. So we need to know at any given point in time, the sooner you update the schedule, the sooner you'll get that knowledge. The more frequently you update the schedule, the better. Um, one thing I will also, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of the questions here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Because somebody said no audio. Yes, it looks like it can be. The last thing is, yes, because of the, the nature of this data, it can be used to compare with things like payment applications, and it can be used to dictate or understand performance, which, you know, if performance is lacking, you need to know, you need to have some digital um, representation of that, as well as, you know, again, reviewing payment applications, that's a process, that's a process for contractors to, to study subpayment apps. It's also a process for owners to study contractor app payment applications, which is, a, you know, as we all know, a very important part of the process is that payments are being made, they're being made timely, they're not overstated, they're not understated, because payment issues can cause problems, they can cause delays, so this also serves as a great tool for making sure that the payment applications are accurate and that there's no problems there as well. Visually speaking, I'm going to go back into this critical path and near critical path representation. Here is a output that comes from Smart PM. You know, we we want to be able to summarize the schedule so you can oversee it. You know, if you recall, if everybody who's ever used a schedule and printed that thing out, sometimes it can be very voluminous. But here's a one page representation of a project that will show you why updating is important. It really aligns with what I was talking about with the critical path. If we look at different update periods, which in this case is monthly, which is typically a contractual uh, obligation as a monthly update. I like weekly. I like every two weeks. Monthly is good enough, but after monthly, that you usually have a problem. But you can see here that between one update and the next, you can start seeing things moving around. In this case, we still see a similar critical path, but we're starting to see shortening of durations or things getting pushed off in the in, in the build out. If I keep going, I start to see changes in the critical path. I, I went from this update that said the structure is critical until basically the end of December, and then we've got to get our conveyances in and our uh, elevators in, and then we can get into our punch and close. And I see a near critical path forming here, which is nice to know. Exterior skin getting into our interior build outs, getting into our punch and close. But that changed, something changed didn't really shouldn't really have changed your process because you can see that there's been some flip-flopping of near critical and critical you know the tower no longer is the true critical path until january now that's pushed out a little bit but we can see that what we really need to start planning for here as we go up the tower is, is getting people in line with with getting the skin done on time and ultimately where we're really going to see criticality is throughout the building and up through the punch list and that's good to know and that that continues to be updated over time and knowing those things is important which you wouldn't know if you didn't do an updating process you if you did your updating process and you just focused on that original update which i'll scroll back and show you you would really hone in on this uh construction structure um until december and not really think too much about these other items especially because most of these tools don't show you the near critical path they show you the critical path and the non-critical path that's why we like to highlight it. But as you can see, it is a dynamic thing and it is very important to see these things in real time. Uh, one other thing to note is that updates are a point in time when schedules can fall apart. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but the reality is, you know, you build a schedule, you update it, you know, you have to follow these best practices or else the schedule, just like the baseline, can become misleading, and that's a problem. So at that point in time, if you guys have all done this before or worked with people who've done this before, those are points in time where changes are made. The, you know, and changes are made for different reasons. Um, sometimes changes that should be made are not being made, and sometimes the changes that are being made are not actually re realistic, and they're done in a manner to keep to an end date, even though there's risks embedded in the schedule that we're not overlaying. And all the while, when changes happen to a schedule, 
happen to the quality or can happen to the quality. It can be affected. So this is a point in time. It's basically just like the baseline. You have to make sure that there is a good process followed and that there's checks and balances to ensure that the schedule being utilized going forward is following all those same rules that we talked about and that it is feasible and it is understandable and that the critical path is trustable. So this is a point that we have seen in many different cases. We've studied all of our data on 20,000 plus uh, across 20,000 plus schedules and we've seen that the quality of the schedule typically gets worse through updates. So I want to speak to that today so that we all can know that this is an important point in time for those reasons, but it's also a risky point in time uh, because people make haphazard changes. And if the quality goes away, we run into more problems that can cause, you know, overruns, delays, and, and ultimately uh, end up in, in a dispute situation, which is exactly what, what we here at Smart PM are trying to help people stay out of. So. We're going to talk a little bit about a process that works and to some of you you all know that this may be you know basic stuff but again we're going to cover it all uh so that everybody here on the call can understand everything about this process and you towards the end of this we'll get into some more advanced information but number one is walking and walking the site and statusing the job um this may seem pretty straightforward but most of the time when I work with people, they're not walking the site and statusing the job on that Friday afternoon when they're supposed to get their schedule update out of that, you know, end of the month where it's due tomorrow. What they're doing is they're sitting at their desk and they're thinking about what do I recall? Where was this, where was this um, activity? Did, when did it start? What percent complete is it? Uh, usually sitting at their desk. As a matter of fact, we do uh, CPM boot camp training, which is basically a lot of what we're talking about here, but we have workshops and whatnot. And uh, I've even sat down with the teams and said, flat out, you have to walk the job with a copy of the schedule in front of you to start writing down information. And what's most important is that percent complete. It's very important that you get your start dates and your finish dates correct. But it's also very important that your percent completes are accurate and thorough uh, as possible, which walking the job should be able to help you with. If you're just sitting at your desk and you're going off of memory, well, what can happen is your percent completes can be off. And if your percent completes are off, well, guess what? Your critical path may be off. And plus, your start and finish dates need to be accurate as well, because, you know, if you don't have accurate start and finish dates, well, that could be pretty misleading if and when anybody questions any delays that happen on the site. It's not easy when you're walking the site, especially if you're doing a monthly update to always know the exact start date, which is why you could always go reference your dailies and you can reference your photos. So I suggest that whoever walks the site, which could be a super, it could be a PM, it could be an engineer, it could even be the scheduler, print out a copy of the schedule update. Print it out just like it looks on the uh you know program but have a column for actual start and actual finish and as you and, and obviously percent complete should be in there as well and you want to write down your notes you want to say when did this activity start and or finish as you go down the line and if so if it didn't finish and it did start what percent complete are we and you, you want to look around and hopefully your durations aren't too long that's what we talked about if you have long durations it's very hard to status a percent complete and if you're wrong on your percent complete again we discussed that that could affect your critical path so it's important to have uh, a discrete duration that's you know un, you know discrete enough for you to be able to look around engage very close to accurate percent completes so that's the process but writing it down as a starting point and looking at it with your own two eyes is a very important thing and you know it doesn't take too long usually to walk a site uh, unless it's like a mega project, which those projects have tons and tons of schedulers and PMs and supers and very, very complicated schedules, but it should be done on that basis of as this day that we're updating our schedule, what what, do the, what does the data tell us about how far we are with these activities and have we started, have we finished, what percent complete are we on these things as you move throughout the project? But again, being accurate and as thorough as possible is an important thing. Um, you don't want to have erroneous information or it's that garbage in, garbage out situation. And in a way to combat that, if you're not 100% sure, is 
while you're walking the site, while you're looking at that sheet of paper, while you're logging in that information. If there's any questions, you do need to star that area and I can double check the dailies. I got to go double check the, the, the photos just to make sure I can be as accurate as possible on this first time around. The next thing, and this is again, fairly straightforward. Once you get that information, now this becomes a work paper and you don't want to lose that work paper. You want to go then sit in front of the computer with that data and you want to start logging it in. Now, everybody here probably sees a Microsoft project uh, file, which this is true for both Primavera and Microsoft Project. Most of our trainings that we do are with companies that are learning Microsoft Project and prefer to learn Microsoft Project. Uh, but for purposes of this, this training, this is true with both Primavera and Microsoft. You want to then go take that data and you want to go plug it into the program. You want to plug in those start dates, those finish dates, and those percent completes for everything that, that, that was updated via that record that you walked around the site with. You want to then double check it you know again i'm going to i'm going to say this to everybody scheduling is monotonous scheduling takes time if you don't double check your work every every step of the way you're again putting your project at risk which is a problem again we talked about the, the importance of accuracy of data double checking your work in a monotonous thing is very very important i know it's not fun i know that sometimes on fridays you just want to leave but it, it, if you are out there and you're looking to do what everybody's trying to do, and that's manage a job effectively to keep it on time, on budget, and out of court, a few extra minutes or extra half hour of double checking your work goes a long way towards achieving that goal. The next thing, and this is interesting with Microsoft Project, we've seen a ton of people who use Microsoft Project forget to do one very important thing, and that's to update the status date. So once you log that data, you need a data date as of the point of that data so that that program knows that this data is collected as of this certain day, and then it can recalculate everything for you. It'll recalculate the, the, the finish dates of all future activities. It'll recalculate all the float, which will then potentially recalculate the critical path. In Microsoft Project, this is where we see most people who use Microsoft Project forget to do this step. As a matter of fact, we've worked with companies before that have been scheduling for years and forgetting to do data dates or, or status dates. So how do you do that in Microsoft Project? Well, you go to Project, you click Status Date, and you punch in the date for which that data was entered. Primavera has a similar way of doing that, but what that does is it brings the line to current and recalculates everything that's incomplete as of today and all the constraints and all the relationships and all the remaining durations form a new plan. Uh, potentially, and yes, usually it is a new plan. Uh, and, and a pro tip I'll give you right here, which a lot of people miss this step too, is once you log in the data, just the start date, the finish date, and the percent complete information, save that file as a status update or status only update. So I've made no changes to this data. It's basically last month's schedule with today's as built information with a data date pulled to today. And that first and foremost serves as the beginning of what's called a half step analysis for studying delay. Whatever happens to the end date in that moment, when you status a schedule without making any changes, that was the delay in the month from, from the end date from the previous update to now. If you study the difference between the end date then and the end date now, that was your delay in the period. It's a very simple calculation and, and you want to know that. A lot of people don't want to think about it. A lot of people don't want to talk about it. A lot of people want to go make changes before anybody sees it because they don't want anybody to know that the end date slipped. But the reality is we need to know. We need to know if the end date slipped and we need to know what happened to the critical path. So I suggest to everybody, when you update the schedule the first time around, you save a copy of it with no changes and you never get rid of that copy. You can go make changes now. But save that as a different copy because this will help you down the road in the event you need to study delays and causation and whatnot and then response to this because you know we talk about these changes changes are important a lot of times people make changes to to basically overcome historic delay but if that becomes the process that you're not actually studying the delay but you're just updating the schedule making changes bringing the end date back in and then you don't even realize what the delay was well, that's where we start getting into a situation where finger pointing happens and people argue over what delayed the job 
So having this status only update is a very important thing for making sure you cover yourself down the road. Next thing is to think about changes. Now, one thing I'll say about changes is a lot of changes on the fly and they're not discussing it with anybody else. They just sit in their computer. They notice the end date slipped. They start go rewiring a few things, but they're not talking to others about it. They're not discussing the feasibility of these changes, which becomes a problem. It becomes actually a management nightmare because usually that results in a lot of compression. So that's your moment where you need to start thinking about changes. And these changes can vary from different things. They can be change orders. They could be duration changes. They could be resequencing of some things because now you see delays happening. It could be the removal of crew logic because now we notice a delay happen and we've got to identify that critical path going forward. And we need to you know, start to stagger some of these trades and start to think about getting additional resources out there. But it's very important that at that moment, you're not just sitting alone by yourself, thinking through changes, making those changes, and then submitting the schedule for approval. There, there, there does need to be some sort of accountability. There does need to be some sort of, you know, uh, strategic thinking here. So the first thing you want to do is you want to identify the areas where schedule changes may be necessary or useful. You, as the person looking at the schedule, may find some areas that need to be tweaked a little bit in your mind. So you want to start off by thinking through that a little bit, not just jumping right in and doing it. Next thing you want to do is you want to have that log of ideas and have a discussion. Have a discussion with the parties that are relevant to those changes, which could, which could be the PM, it could be the super, it could be the owner, it could be all the subs or any of the subs. You, you want to make sure that if you are going to go ahead and commit to certain changes, that the people around the project, the people managing the project, the people working on the job, the people building things like the trade contractor or anybody involved in, in, in any of these change order issues are understanding of these changes and on board with those decisions before you make any of those changes. I call that a working session. So once you get buy-in, and buy-in is very important in construction, which is quite frequently overlooked in the scheduling process. But once you have that discussion, it's very important to then go put that into the schedule. And after that, we have to go back to step one, make sure quality is maintained. You know, if you remove logic, if you shorten durations, if you, you know, change some things around, any, you know, if you didn't make any changes, your schedule would have the same exact quality as the last update. If you go in and you start making changes, quality can change for various reasons. And like we talked about, this is a monotonous process frequently. We can't assume that the changes being made don't affect the quality in a negative way. And we need to make sure that our quality is up to our standard so that we can trust the critical path. And when I say quality, I mean compliance. Some people use these words interchangeably. Quality of schedule is about how well it's built and does it comply with all of the things that we set forth in our quality rubric to make sure that we're following best practices. Now, the last piece is to then publish the schedule or submit it. But be very honest with the changes that are being made and why they're being made. You know, a lot of times this back and forth doesn't happen, but coming from the world of claims that I did and delay analyses, when all these things start to, you know, get overlooked and not discussed, you know, quite frequently people are surprised down the road when things don't work out. And that's when the arguments ensue. And like I said, our goal here at Smart PM is to help people keep on track, on budget, and or out of court through that dispute resolution process. And if you're not if you're not disclosing things throughout the process and being forthright and collaborative in the process, that ends up becoming a problem down the road that, that could become a very costly problem. So I recommend once you incorporate these changes, you log them in. And it's good for two reasons. Number one, you're being very open and honest. But number two, you're documenting it. So say two years down the road, somebody comes back to you and says, well, what, what did you make this change for? Or why did you make that change? If you're in sitting in some sort of dispute situation, well, guess what? You have all that information and you didn't have to go back and backtrack and, and make up memories or, you know, think of what, what was I thinking at the time? You have it all laid out for you for your future use. And that's why I say publish that, write it down, notify all the parties of the changes being made. 
Oh, and the other tip is at that point, you save a second copy with your changes. You call that you call that your submission for approval, your update. It's inclusive of changes. So now you've got two schedules. You've got your status updated on that date. You will always want to put the date in the title of the schedule file. Uh, and then on that, you've got that same date that says schedule update, which could include your uh, your changes. So now we talk about change. This is to me where this this is where decisions are being made. And those decisions need to be understood. So first and foremost, I believe that, like I said before, schedule changes are inevitable. Uh, when you create a plan based on what you think before you even start the work, the reality is things are going to change, and they're going to change for different reasons. There, uh, maybe maybe a change order. Maybe uh, you're not getting enough resources. Maybe there's delays happening that you can't control, and now you've got to resequence, or maybe the owner's asking you to resequence. Maybe um, maybe it's raining. Uh, maybe maybe we have issues of getting supplies, and we've got to completely change the way in which we're approaching it because we don't have the necessary equipment. So many different reasons. Construction's a constantly changing and evolving thing. Uh, for that reason, we have to change. Uh, but we don't we don't want to go crazy on the changes. We want to keep this as minimum as possible because the more the changes, the more the risk. The next thing is changes should reflect reality, not hope. You know, a lot of times, like I said before, people will update a schedule, they'll see the end date kick out, they'll go start making changes specifically to bring the end date in without actually thinking about the uh, reality of that. That becomes a hopeful situation. And if we remember from a couple of weeks ago, Usually schedules are optimistic to begin with. That's true just from human nature, but it's also true from the data for which we've studied. Um, if you're making changes to bring the end date in specifically out of hope, you're really not doing yourselves any favors. You're compressing a already optimistic schedule, which can cause problems. And you wanna make sure that these, these things that you're changing have been understood, are achievable, are bought into by others. And it's not just some sort of hopeful thing. The other thing to really think about is when making changes, if that alters the critical path, we've got to really think about that and really understand what happened to the old critical path and what is the new critical path and is, does that jive with reality? You know, I would question all of those changes, changes that affect the critical path. And that's what's going to be looked at as well in the schedule review process. The other thing to note is changes to mitigate delay are the risky ones. That's where we start getting into hope. If we're if we're just bringing the end date back in because delays have happened, we're not really studying the delays, but we just want to get that end date in and we hope it works out and or we believe it's going to work out. But part of that's hopeful. You know, the only way that you get there, if you want to bring the end date in, which again results in compression, is uh, by making changes to the critical path. That's the that's the first line of defense. That's the first thing somebody's going to do if the end date kicked out. They go right to the critical path, then they go to the near critical path. Those changes are the risky ones. Those are the ones that need to be studied and questioned. And the other thing is we always got to check the, the, the effect of changes on quality and compression and the end date. So changes, these are decisions. These are decisions being made. Every single change in the schedule is a decision being made at the time. And we've got to make sure that there's a good process about that. We've got to make sure that it's not affecting quality. We've got to make sure that we're not getting too compressed. And if we are, that we have a game plan for that. And we've got to also study the effect on the end date. Was it pushing it in? Was it pulling it out? Why did that happen? Because the end date is a dynamic thing as well. And it's all controllable via the plan going forward. In my experience, and this is unfortunate, changes are rarely made to reflect reality instead they're made with hopes of overcoming delays that's that's a, become a problem in the industry that's why there's programs out there studying changes that's why there's programs that exist and have existed for a couple of decades now that study changes it started with claim digger went into fuse you know even smart pm looks at changes we look at critical near critical we look at all changes 
but it's an important part. But because of the nature of construction, because of the nature that these schedules weren't being built well, because of the nature that those programs didn't allow you to really study delay, rather just gave you opportunities and time to, quote, write the ship. Most people or many people take that as an opportunity to compress the schedule in hope. Um, they're not doing it most of the time, not doing it maliciously. They're doing it because we're optimistic people in construction and we want to get the job done and we're going to come, we're going to do it come hell or high water, even if it's, you know, our own disadvantage. And that's really why we've got to think about this change process and we've got to incorporate feasibility into that process. And that's done through all the recommendations that we talked about. Here's some examples of, of, of real projects that we can quantify the extent of changes and see what happens to the quality. But you can see when, when changes start to become rampant, we are tracking those critical changes. We're also looking at changes here. This, you can see that we hit this nice spot where the schedule's in good quality, but when changes start to happen, we start to see the, the, that the quality can suffer. The other thing we can look at is why are those changes happening? Right. If you see delay, we're monitoring our delay here. We're also monitoring what's going on with the end date and what sort of acceleration measures are being put in due to changes. You can see that that mirrors that time frame where the quality is getting worse, where delays are happening and the end date's not moving. The only way that can happen is if changes are happening. And then we can see the effect, the risk, the compression. This starts to tell us. Are we trying to do too much work in too little time? In this case, those changes because of those delays ultimately resulted in a compression factor of roughly 50% or 45%, meaning that in the remainder of the job, we've pushed off so many things and we've compressed so many things or shortened so many durations to keep to that end date that we're not trying to do 45% more work in the remaining duration of the job. And that's really only evident through changes, and it's really only the result. If you don't make any changes to the schedule, if you just update the schedule and make no changes, that quality would remain the same, the delay and the end date variance would remain the same, and the compression would not mount. Unless, of course, compression can result from things being pushed off or consuming float. So that would be another area that would ultimately result in compression, but it's kind of a, a, a balanced thing that you need to study. These are things that we'll talk a little bit about next week as it is getting more into the project controls realm. So why is compression a problem? Well, it's misleading. Uh, you know, compression is usually, like I mentioned, compression can happen for two reasons. Number one, items that have float don't get started because they have float so more work is getting pushed off and that wouldn't affect the end date because they have float it's just more work getting pushed off and the remaining critical and near critical work you know happening in suit or it could be a combination of things not going as planned and you're pushing things off as well as things not going as planned and you are in your shortening critical path and near critical path durations going forward so what happens in that reality is that things could become misleading. You know, compression can result in a situation where trades are stacked. And, and you know, when you originally created the plan, the goal usually is to have a trade come in and a trade, you know, when, when one trade's done, the next one comes in. And then that trade goes to the next area. Uh, and usually it's done with one or two crews in mind. But when you start to compress the schedule due to changes, what you end up doing is you start stacking areas and you start stacking trades so the trades aren't actually getting that area fully complete when they show up and there may be some people and equipment around that's in their way and they may not be hitting their durations that haven't changed because now it's a little bit more of a challenge and they may require more resources that they haven't been notified about or they haven't been able to discuss and see because the the person was just making changes to keep to an end date. So what ends up happening there is this, the project starts to form a world that's misleading to them and potentially unachievable. And yet they're being asked to get it done and get it done and get it done. And all the while owners are looking at an end date that's not changing, even though the schedule may have gotten so compressed that it's unachievable with the trades. So this begins to become that process of, um, finger pointing and arguing because the owner's trying as hard as to believe that this project's on track. The contractor's hoping 
that things go as planned, even though more things need to happen in a short amount of time. And the subs are sitting there, um, you know, wondering, why do I need more people? Uh, why are these people in my way? How is this going to affect my durations? And it starts to become an inefficiency. So that's why it's a, a, a challenge. Uh, the other reason is, you know, if you have a schedule that's overly compressed and you've made so many changes to compress it, and you maybe the quality has suffered, whatever it may be, maybe there's not going to be enough crews to ever show up and do it. Um, well, the critical path could be off. And again, we talked about that all last week. If the critical path is inaccurate and you're actually trusting it, well, guess what? Something else may be the job and you don't even know it. And that's because the schedule has gotten so compressed that the quality has suffered and all of a sudden we're relying on a critical path that's inaccurate and infeasible. Um, and that ends up just, you know, perpetuating the problem. And that's where you start to get into those claim situations. And those claim situations could be claims coming from the subs or it could be claims going to the owner about erroneous delay issues that your broken schedule says are the problem which of course often results in disputes. So this, this process that we're talking about, I hope it's resonating with people that when you do an update, you wanna get it accurate and thorough. You wanna have a copy of the schedule before it gets changed. You wanna then go have real conversations about those changes. You wanna make sure that the extent of those changes aren't putting this project at risk due to over compression. If you do all those things and you are very forthright with these discussions and you're very forthright with you know understanding what delays were happening while they were happening because now you've got both those schedule updates and you then understand what decisions were made to overcome them and you did monitor you know the extent of those changes to make sure that you're not putting your schedule at risk from a quality or compression perspective that's where you start to get to better outcomes and more importantly if you think about this first item you have better relationships. You have better relationships with your subs and you have your better relationships with your owners. So let's talk a little bit about the review process. So once we get that update, now there's a review process. I recommend that this review process starts with the company that's built and updated the schedule, the company that's responsible for doing that. So we'll say the contractor is usually the one, but let's just say first and foremost, there should be a check and balance in this process uh, to review the schedule update before it's published by, say, maybe a project controls team or maybe a, you know, a peer scheduler, or if the PMs are doing it, there should be a master scheduler looking at it. And if you don't have a scheduler and if you have a PM submitting it in a, like a small to medium sized construction business, then you need some sort of executive oversight. But there does need to be a process because of all these risks that we just talked about. You know, a lot of times it's not about being malicious. It's about having enough time. It's having enough know-how. It's knowing the right steps and it's making sure that your business is being accountable. And that's what this update review process is because chances are somebody's going to review it once you submit it. Um, and you don't want it coming back rejected and you don't want it coming back with a lot of questions. You want to make sure that when you submit this schedule, it is the plan and it's a feasible plan and that when it gets taken by the other person to review it, the owner, that they can appreciate it, they can understand it and they don't see risks happening and they don't question your intentions because that's where um, that's where friction starts. And that's where these, uh, you know, <laughs> that's where the relationships start to go sour. So first and foremost, whether you're on the owner side or you're on the contractor side, number one is you got to ensure quality is main maintained. Run it through a program, run it through Smart PM, run it through Acumen Fuse, run it through any program that does some sort of quality analysis. If not, if it's not maintained, then that means changes have been made and we've got to correct those deficiencies before we do anything. You don't even want to study the changes at that point. You got to make sure that the schedule adheres to the quality standards as a starting point. One of the things I'll tell you about uh, Quality here is there is the DCMA 14 point check, which is usually the structural integrity, but there's also risk issues that can happen that aren't picked up by DCMA. These are metrics that we've learned and we've incorporated into our process, but we've learned it through our customers. 
there's backdated activities, there's changing actual dates, there's decreased percent completes, there's activities that are started with 0% complete, there's future actual dates, there's mis missing actual finish dates. So backdated activity is an activity that, you know, came in and you've backdated the information after the fact. You've, you've, you've then statused it and said it actually started, even though last month we said it didn't start, but you've gone ahead and said it actually did start. So last month's update is potentially erroneous. Then there's changing the actual dates. This risk comes when somebody's sitting at their desk and saying, okay, I'm gonna update the schedule from my desk today, and I'm gonna guess on everything until somebody comes along and gives me better information. Well, if you're putting in wrong start dates and wrong finish dates from the get-go, that's the sign of not taking the process seriously and coming back and changing everything, which again, muddies the waters in the event there's any discussions about delays and impacts. Increasing percent completes, think about that. This month I say it's 60% done. Next month I come along and it's only 40% done, which means that last month's schedule was erroneous and maybe the critical path was erroneous and maybe we were managing to an erroneous critical path now that I know is a different one. Well, guess what? That's a risk. That's a problem. That means that we need to be accurate. If you see lots of decreased percent completes, you've got to go have the conversation that this is unacceptable. Activities that are started with 0% complete. A lot of times people say an activity started last week or last month, and yet it's 0% complete. And now the remaining durations, just like the original duration, and, and it's been updated, but what if we're really 50% complete and somebody forgot to update the, the percent complete? Again, this could affect your critical path, your near critical path, and it can cause problems. Putting in future actual dates, that's a mistake. You can't guess the future, you shouldn't guess the future. If the activity didn't start, it didn't start. But sometimes people mess up and put in future actual dates, which again, can update and, and, and modify the critical path of the job. And then missing actual finish dates. People can forget to put the actual finish date and it just keeps riding the data date and it becomes this long drawn out activity that we don't even know what's going on with that. And again, this is something that can bite you in the event that there's a dispute down the road. Schedule update review process it is seek out study changes from the former to current schedules made. So we wanna also look at changes. We start with quality, then we move into changes. We wanna look at duration changes. We wanna look at logic changes. We wanna look at added deleted activities. We wanna look at calendar changes. And we wanna look at the critical and near critical changes. Right. Remember, going back to what we were talking about, you know, changes are going to happen, but we've got to really hone in on what was the critical path, which is why you'd have that status update uh, with no changes made, because then you can go see of those activities, which ones were changed and the critical and near critical path. What was the end date had there not been any changes? What is it now? And what durations were changed on those critical and near critical tasks? What logic was changed? How did they go about getting that end date to where it is today? And are, are those feasible decisions? Are they shortening durations? Are they gonna hit those durations? Are they stacking trades? Are we gonna get enough resources? We've gotta be able to study that. Are they modifying calendars? Are they, are they adding a Saturday now? Are they going to bring the people on Saturday? Are they delete, outright deleting activities? You know, I've seen all of this stuff and usually it's, it's, it's hovering around critical and near critical tasks. And those are the ones that you need to question. So again, you've got to determine if and why the critical path has shifted uh, and, and whether or not that's feasible. Uh, assess the level of compression to determine if this schedule is trustable. We got to also, you know, always use that gut check. You know, I talked about it last week. Quality can only take you so far, but when you're a person who understands construction and you understand how to manage a job, well, you need to use your gut sometimes to make sure that I'm looking at this schedule it's giving me a time frame. I'm looking at the project. I, I've built things like this before. This critical path says X, Y, and Z. That feels right. Uh, you know, you have to think through those things because quite frequently you'll find somebody show up and say, there's no way this thing's getting done in six months. And why is the critical path going through the site work? We've still got, you know, half the building to put up. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. And it's all about making sure that if we're gonna leverage this CPM scheduling process to its entirety, 
to manage our risk, we need to follow these steps to make sure that the schedule is not falling apart, to make the schedule, make sure that it's not misleading, to make sure that it's infeasible or not infeasible, to make sure that it's achievable. Because if it is all those things, then you actually have a plan. And there's all these little pitfalls that we've been talking about throughout the process, which again, make schedules fall apart. And, and I will show you from our experience or tell you from our experience, having looked at many, many different schedules, if you look at baseline, you look at all the updates, what you'll notice across the board is that quality usually suffers as you get to the end of the job or throughout. It gets worse and worse and worse. Schedules get more compressed. Um, updates typically represent less delay than actually happened. And FPI, schedule performance indices, generally hover around 60 to 80 percent, meaning that most projects at best are operating at 80 percent the original earned value curve, which again is a problem, which tells us that optimization or, uh, optimism is a problem in construction. So all of those little things make it so important for us to understand the value of this, this and why best practices need to be followed. So why is it a problem? Why are unrealistic and poor quality schedules harmful? Well, I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. Erroneous critical path. That results in mismanagement. That results in focusing on areas that don't actually dictate the end of the job or maybe not drive the end of the job while all the while you may be missing the point, you may be missing the area that is and in the end it's just gonna keep suffering and suffering and suffering under your nose and undetected. Uh, the schedule will become over, overly compressed. This results in inefficiencies. This results in poor quality of work and or claims. So if you over compress the schedule and the trades aren't truly bought in and they're not bringing enough resources, well, you're generally kicking the can down the road. Uh, and that results in inefficiencies too. So all these trade contractors are trying to get things done on time. They're tripping over each other. Their productivity suffers. What happens then, right? Well, they start spending more money. Uh, they have to pay these people uh, and then all of a sudden they realize well we we've spent more money than we've we've billed for and guess what this project's not making us any money uh it's stressed it's we're fatigued they're asking us to work overtime you know just to get things done they're blaming delays on us well that starts to to result in you know poor outcomes as well and then the worst part is the project is more delayed and nobody understands why or realizes it until it's too late. That's why, you know, so many projects seem to go through that process of everything's fine until it's not on that day. You know, all of a sudden the end date blows out and yes, we're not getting it done on time and all these reasons that we're saying are, you know, we can't prove, but it's all because the schedule fell apart. And that's when the arguments ensue. That's when the claims start happening. That's when the finger pointing starts happening. And that's where, you know, ultimately people end up arguing until the end of the job and everybody leaves mad and there's budgets over, overrun and liquidated damages are being talked about. You know, this is that place. And, 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 and I can assure you through my studying of schedule data from my whole career, a lot of it manifests in this schedule updating process. And yes, the worst part is it's late and over budget and nobody's happy. I'm going to give you guys some do's and don'ts. And again, it looks like we have some questions. I'm going to try to get to these questions as quickly if I can get through this. But I'm going to give you some do's and don'ts. I don't think I'm going to get through all, of the, get to the questions today. But like last week, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll hop on, I'll look at these questions, I'll respond, and we'll send out an email answering these questions to everybody so you can see it because there's a little bit to cover here. Status updates in real time. So when you update a schedule for today or when that schedule is due, you want it updated through today. You don't want to submit a schedule from a month ago, a month late. I was on a project where it got pretty convoluted in that, you know, there was checks and balances on both the owner and the contractor side. The contractor was using the schedule to build a claim and the owner was using, you know, the schedule to beat up on the, on the, on the owner. They didn't want to accept changes. They, 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 there was not a lot of trust in the process. So what ended up happening was the schedule wasn't getting approved. In this case, three months after the fact. So the March update was being approved in June. 
and the April update was being approved in July. Um, well, what did that do to the job? It, it, it made it so nobody really had a schedule that they could trust and there was all sorts of fear on the site and everybody was going as hard as they could, but you know, the schedule was never finalized. So it ended up becoming just a project that was managed without a schedule. And the funny thing was there was 10 schedulers being paid full time, you know, to the tune of, you know, call it 70, 80 grand a month to, to, to run an academic exercise and butt heads with the owner. So it was pointless. So I say update schedules in real time, you know, oh, this is responsible for the owner and the contractor to review and approve it, or else we fall into this pitfall of it being late and, and things not, you know, really mattering anymore because there's no schedule. Uh, I say do it consistently. You know, sometimes I'll see updates happening, you know, every two weeks. Sometimes I'll see a schedule update in a month and then three months later, there's another update. The reality is at a minimum update a schedule one time per month and be very consistent with that. Um, I actually think it's better for any contractor to be updating it weekly. It takes less time per week and it keeps everybody on the same page. Some people argue that that's four times the amount of work. It's not. It's actually more accurate data because when you take an update on a Friday, every Friday, you can think back the last week and be very accurate on your, on your start dates and your finish dates. If you wait till the end of the month, a lot more things happen in that month and then you've got to go recollect actual start dates and actual finish dates. So it's actually more work, I believe, if you wait till the end of the month. Uh, we talked about this, modifying schedules based on decisions. You know, if you're not doing that, if you're just making changes, well, guess what? You're just going to end up causing problems. And, and, and especially if you're an optimistic, hopeful one, and you really are scared to have a conversation about delay, which happens quite frequently in construction because delay is a taboo word. Owners hate seeing it. Contractors hate admitting it. But the reality is the more you talk about delay, uh, the more forthright you talk about the modifications that you're making because of those delays, in reality, the better outcomes and the better relationships along the way is, believe it or not, we've seen it a hundred times at SmartPM because what our product does is it, it, it shows all this information to the owner and or the contractor and it makes it very clear. Uh, some people used to think that that would cause more arguments, but in reality, we see a lot of our owners and contractors working together to get things done together with the same information. And it turns out working in everybody's favor because there's no there's no BS and everybody nobody likes BS and uh, nobody likes feeling like they're being lied to and once you have all that information in front of you and you're discussing it and and you're making good decisions and talking about it and getting that buy-in better things happen and it's just unfortunate that so many projects don't understand that adjust the plan based on historical performance you know, a lot of people don't want to go say that the drywall guy is taking 10 days instead of five, and I'm going to go adjust that. Uh, I'm going to go push that end date out a little bit because that's what's happening. But if you don't do that, you're you're ultimately causing more problems. You're you're hoping again. You're not seeing if the drywall is actually going to become critical or whatever that trade may be that's not achieving those durations. If you're not incorporating reality into the plan, what you end up having is a schedule that's misleading. And what, what also happens is if you do do that and it does push out the end date and it is based on actual durations being achieved, which could be longer or shorter than what you estimated, you know what happens is you then can see where you're gonna need additional proofs with certainty and you can make those good, decis those good decisions. Um, again, you gotta incorporate those resource and trade constraints, those, those crew logic. You've gotta maintain accurate crew logic a lot of times people will just rip out logic and stack trades, not do anything about it. That again goes to, you know, a situation where we don't understand really how to manage this job, but we keep making changes to keep to an end date. And we're not actually going out and making those changes in the field. That's called crashing the schedule. Documenting all the modifications. That's a do. Um, you know, it, it's good for you today for yourself. It's good for you to be forthright to the teams around you. It's also good as a reminder down the road of your thinking, your decision making, and justifying those decisions without having to go relive it, you know, a year down the road and try to remember. Um, I say you should always be doing a delay analysis every single month. Most companies don't do this. I think you should. 
That's why we like that status update only. That's why we like the, the next copy where we're studying recovery. Um, being able to look at the update, the end date shift from one update to the next before you make those changes is your delay. When you bring that end date back in through changes, that's how much acceleration you're bringing in. These are things that we track in Smart PM, but it also, without using a, a product like Smart PM, it's very simple to do if you follow these steps that we talked about. Because you don't want to save the delay analysis till the end of the job. That's like a recipe for a dispute. Now, there's a difference between a claim and a dispute. Most people don't know this. Uh, it's very simple. A claim is a request and a dispute is an argument. A claim with good justification is not a dispute. It's a request that's probably going to be approved. Until it's argued, that's a dispute. And then once that dispute gets argued to court, that, that's where we get into litigation. So claims are fine. Disputes are bad. You need to justify your claims and having all this paper trail is important. Um, I always like using three week look aheads. Uh, a lot of times people try to walk around with a big thick stack of papers, but having both copies and even giving the super the ability to take the schedule and add more detail in a program like Procore some, uh, or even Excel, you can do that because the, the super has usually a more detailed view. Uh, good mechanisms to keep up with things as well is put it into the super size that might be much more detailed, but have them do it over a three week plan. But modified against this baseline that we believe is a quality or this update that we believe is quality. Always look at schedule quality. But that should be about the last bit of information we'll talk about. We are up on our time. Next week, we're going to go over schedule analyzing schedule quality. We're going to talk about different rubrics. We're going to then study. We're going to talk about how do you analyze delay and recovery via changes. We're going to talk about how do we study project performance? How do we turn that into charts, trends, and reports? Analyzing schedule compression, looking at feasibility, predicting outcomes with all this information that you've collected. These are next level things that you can do with the schedule information that we want to teach you about next week. And then how do you pull all that information together at each update or throughout to make better decisions? And then because I come from the world of delay, you know, spent a lot of my career, you know, there's some things that not anybody understands of the delay analysis process, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But for today, again, I really appreciate you coming, really appreciate your time. Next week, schedule oversight and analytics that will conclude our four-part series, and I look forward to seeing you there. And yes, if you want to get a hold of anybody, if you want to talk to anybody here, a lot of people reached out last week, please reach out to us at info at smartpm tech.com if you have any questions if you have any thoughts please feel free to share share them with us there and we look forward to seeing you next week have a great day have a great weekend